Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Wally Smith at EVA Wise here with what I guess is our third installment of some virtual wildlife chats, basically nerd out sessions with people that I really like in the region that are experts on the outdoors and on wildlife. And if you haven't viewed some of the previous installments that we've had of this, uh, the idea behind these is that we know right now there's a lot of folks stuck at home. Uh, whether you're a college student or a family or just by yourself looking to learn and not just have to sit on the couch and do nothing. So we've been providing some of these chats for folks to learn about the place where they live with wildlife and the outdoors. I had a chat a couple weeks ago on mountain chorus frogs and amphibian species, talked about vernal pools, a really cool habitat last week, and really excited to switch things up a little bit this week uh, with some more mammal related content with Seth Thompson, who you see on your screen, who is the local wildlife biologist with the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. And so I'll turn it over to Seth and let him kind of talk about black bears, as you can see on your screen. I will stop taking your time rambling and let him go and explain a little bit, a little bit about what he does and also about uh, black bears here in the region. So Seth, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Wally. Uh, so as Wally said, my name is Seth Thompson and I'm the district wildlife biologist based here in Wise for the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. And I have six counties that I cover and manage terrestrial wildlife in. Uh, but what I thought we'd do today is talk about one critter that I definitely spent a lot of time uh, working on here, and that is the black bear. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about black bears, what they are, uh, what they are not, uh, and how to live with bears and, and coexist on the landscape with bears, especially here in Southwest Virginia. So I, I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit today about black bears talk about some of their biology and sort of their life strategy and how they get through um, and to help kind of explain why they come into conflict with people and and also hopefully you know a lot of us have uh, some knowledge about bears either you've seen a documentary on tv or whatever about bears uh, so we all have a little bit of a knowledge about black, black bears but i was hoping to try to maybe dispel some of the the misinformation uh, maybe tell you something maybe you didn't already know about black bears. So that's kind of my goal for everybody today. Uh, just for everybody's information, this is a bear in a yard in the city of Norton here in Wise County, uh, an issue that I respond to quite often. And it's just starting to, to ramp up. Bears are starting to come out of their dens and start and are hungry and are looking for easy meals. So this is a, a classic thing that I, I deal with every year, starting about this time of year here in, uh, in Wise County. Uh, but just to sort of start with, you know, it's the American black bear. That's the common name. Ursus americanus is the, the scientific name. But they actually come in a multitude of, of color phases. Uh, and all these are the same species, same genus and species, the American black bear. But as you can see, they can be cinnamon colored. They can be blonde or brown, uh, even sort of a gray or slate color. Uh, out west in more dry or arid environments, they tend to be more of the cinnamon or, or uh, brownish phase. And a lot of times they get confused with grizzly bears, but those are definitely American black bears, uh, just in a different color phase. Uh, they also, we also have the Kermode Island uh, or spirit bear. Uh, you can see in the top right on the cover of uh, National Geographic, a uh, very white colored bear, uh, really interesting, but these are all the same species that we have here in Virginia. All our bears here in the Eastern United States are usually black. Sometimes there's some brown patches. Uh, sometimes they have a white chest patch, which is really cool. We see a lot of that here in Southwest Virginia. But these are all the same species. And another thing, you know, claws, and this is something to sort of distinguish uh, black bears from other species of bears. Black bears evolved in, the, in a forested environment or near a forest, and their first instinct when they feel threatened is to climb a tree and that's why they have real short little curved claws down in the bottom right you can see that really are good for climbing and that's really you know in a forested environment when they feel threatened they're going to run to cover run up a tree and then also they do forage in trees any any acorns uh, apples different fruits and things they will climb trees to to eat those um, but on the top right, I, I put just for a comparison, a picture of a grizzly bear's claws. And you'll notice those are really long, a lot straighter, and those claws are for digging. Um, grizzly bears evolved in more open country, and they do a lot of digging, either for um, ground squirrels or roots and tubers that grow out on the prairie or on the tundra. 
And that's also why they have that big hump. You hear about the big shoulder hump on a, on a grizzly bear. That's extra muscles to help them dig. So very different uh, environments that those two species evolved in, and that's why uh, the big difference in claws, but also differences in how they respond to threats. Uh, as I mentioned, black bears are really very passive, um, and they tend to flee, whereas a grizzly bear in open country, there's no trees to climb, there's no cover, and they, you know, so their instinct typically is to, to be defensive and attack, and that's why people uh, you'll hear that grizzly bears are a little more aggressive and a lot more defensive of their personal space than what a black bear is. And black bears, again, they're very passive. They want to climb trees or flee. Um, I know I see a lot of black yeah. bears in the area, but usually I see their butt as they're taking off over the hill. And yes. that's the first time I see them when I'm hiking <laughs> out in the woods. So <laughs> I've experienced that for sure. Absolutely. And of course, their claws, you know, digging up insects, uh, defensive, um, fighting against other bears, maybe marking territory, those types of things as well. Uh, their senses, you know, they can see roughly about as well as we can, we think. They do see in color and that helps them distinguish uh, ripe fruit on a bush, for example, or insects. Uh, and they have what's called the Jacobson's organ, which is in their vomer nasal region, uh, region of their nose. And that sort of help amplifies their sense of smell. A lot of is uh, written and discussed about bears and how well they can smell. And it's true, they, they can smell from very long distances, miles. And that Jacobson's organ is what helps amplify that sense of smell. And there's a lot of other wildlife species that have that Jacobson's organ. Um, dogs, uh, cattle, horses, uh, different species. I think snakes as well. Wally, maybe you can speak to that, but yep. that, it's, it's very common and it's, it's something that helps amplify the sense of smell. Um, hearing is roughly that of a human being as well. Uh, and this is not aggression. I, I have a lot of folks here in Southwest Virginia that say that bear stood up on me. And what they mean is it, it stood up and basically when a bear does that, they're just trying to get a better view or a sense of smell, maybe catch a, the air moving to, to, to try to get a sense of what you are and if you are a threat or not. But when a bear stands up on its hind legs, that is not an aggressive move at all. Uh, it's just a bear curious, trying to assess the situation and if you are a threat or not. As far as their behavior, you know, the bears are mostly solitary except for family groups and during the breeding season. Uh, they're mostly active at dawn or dusk, but any, any time of day, I have a lot of folks that will say, this bear was out in the daytime, you know, there's something wrong with it. And that's not the case at all. Bears get up and are, are active at any time of day. Uh, it is true that as the summer wears on and gets hotter out, that they are more active at night uh, when it's cooler. Uh, and they are omnivorous. You know, a lot of folks think of bears as being a predator, uh, and they do predate on maybe deer fawns or, or rodents or things like that. But for the most part, they're an opportunistic omnivore. They'll eat just about anything. Uh, and this is something I hear all the time. I'm afraid to go outside. I'm a prisoner in my own home. And I, as we discussed a few slides ago, you know, black bears are very passive and their first instinct is to flee and get away from a threat. Um, so a lot of folks are really afraid of black bears. Um, but they're just not out to get us. They're just a really passive animal that are just seeking out easy sources of food. And uh, I have to take my, my friends in the taxidermist business to task sometimes because they, they present bears with open teeth rawr, and claws and stuff. <laughs> but that is not in their nature at all. Uh, they're a very passive, non-aggressive, uh, secretive animal. And you know, a lot of folks, um, are amazed by this, but for every person that is killed by a black bear, because it does happen, it does occasionally happen that people are attacked and, and killed by black bears, but it's very, very rare. But for every one person that is killed in North America by a black bear, 60 are killed by domestic dogs, 180 by bees, 350 by lightning strikes, and 90,000 by other people. So statistically, you are far less likely to get killed by a bear than just about anything. I, I, I think the most dangerous thing we do is just get in our car and drive down the street. Um, so bears are, they're just not out to get us. 
Uh, here in Virginia, we have roughly anywhere from 18 to 20,000 bears in the state from our best estimates. And there's what, eight, eight, over 8 million people sharing the Commonwealth of Virginia together. So you'd think that if they were that aggressive and dangerous that people would be getting hurt just left and right and it, it just doesn't happen. And this is another thing that I hear a lot that a female bear is very, very dangerous. Uh, that if you see a female with cubs that you know you will death by bear will happen and that's just not the case at all uh, but i i asked folks this that true or false one of the most dangerous encounters is getting between a mother black bear and her cubs and most people say absolutely true but that's false more often than not what happens is, is as wally said it's usually the you know the black rear end going down over the hill um, and they'll move away from you. But if you do surprise them, quite often what happens is the mother bear will make a sound that we can't really hear, but the cubs can, and they will scamper up a tree and mother bear will move off uh, and wait for the danger to, to go by. She might sit at the base of the tree and she might even wolf from, and puff at you and slap the ground, but it's extremely rare for a mother black bear to be defensive. Uh, she usually is very passive and just sort of waits uh, for the, the threat to, to dissipate. So what do bears eat? Well, black bears mostly eat vegetation and insects. Those are the, those are the biggies. Uh, you know, acorns, berries, fruits of other uh, species, um, grasses, sedges, clovers, lots of different things, different types of, of lagoons. Um, but mostly vegetation, a lot of folks are surprised by how much, because um, a lot of folks do think of them as predators, uh, but they really aren't. Every now and again, they will, they will take down maybe a deer fawn, um, wild birds, you know, ground dwelling birds, grouse, uh, turkeys, for example, and rodents, they will dig up and eat rodents if they can catch them. But really, uh, for bears, being a predator is a really, um, energy intense. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Uh, it's, it's risky. You know, a deer can kick you in the face or get you with antlers. So it's, it's a risky thing that, that black bears especially don't typically do. Uh, they're mostly a, a, um, a plant eater for the most part. I saw the autumn olive too up at the uh, upper right of the screen. We had a, a lot of that here on campus, EVA wise. And last year, this is just a random story. Uh, we had a class out behind campus and it was the time of year, I think start of the fall, kind of into the summer when the bears are really packing stuff in. And there was a pile of bear scat that was just magenta. I mean, it was like hot pink. <laughs> and it was right in the middle of all those autumn olives. I can only assume it had probably just been gorging itself on the autumn olive fruit probably. And that's what made it that color because, I mean, it was like hot pink. It was, it was interesting <laughs> to see. <laughs> Well, it, it's, it's neat, to, you know, I, I'm one of those weirdos that likes to look at bear poop because you can really get a sense of what it is they're eating. And, and I've seen, you know, bear scats that is just solid ants. It's just nothing but little ants <laughs> uh, in, a, in a glop. Um, but they will eat just about anything, including our garbage, which we'll talk about a little bit. Mm -hmm. But as the summer wears on, it's, it's really important. Bears start to go in what's called hyperphagia. Hyperphagia meaning they eat and a lot and they just try to eat and gain as many calories as they, they possibly can to put on weight and fat for the winter for denning. And so, you know, in the spring, grasses, sedges, uh, other types of vegetation, when you get into the summer, it's more berries and ant nests, especially in the month of August is sort of between berries and before uh, acorns and, and uh, hickory nuts and stuff like that comes on that ants are really crucial. Um, but in the fall, and it has to do with the daylight, the amount of daylight triggers this hyperphagia. It's a total different, uh, totally different uh, metabolic rate for these bears. And they try to put on as many pounds as they can. So it's really crucial. We have acorns, beech nuts, hickory, and stuff like that that comes ripe and falls in the, in the fall of the year. And those are extremely important food sources for bears and other wildlife for that matter. But bears take advantage of that. Any, any food that's in abundance, uh, that's high protein, high carbohydrate, high fat, bears are going to really focus on uh, throughout the year. And so it's just crucial, you know, um, 
acorns, hickory nuts, all those things, berries are very, uh, they vary a lot from year to year. Some years we have good berry crops, some years we don't, and so on. And so years where a bear, we have a lot of good natural foods, you know, maybe there's a good berry crop, maybe there's a really abundant uh, acorn crop in the fall, bears put on weight, they're doing really well, survival uh, is much higher and they tend to have more cubs in those years. Uh, but when those foods fail, which in 2018, we had a pretty bad natural food failure for bears uh, here in Southwest Virginia, and bears were seeking out other sources of food, garbage, fruit trees, pet food, uh, livestock food, chickens, all those sorts of things that were really causing bears to, to be desperate uh, to come around human uh, homes and businesses. And I got a lot of phone calls that year. <laughs> it was pretty crazy, but bears were really having a hard time. Uh, so very important. Uh, but this is something that's really interesting. I, I mentioned, you know, typically July and August, bears are really looking to find ant nests, uh, wild bee nests um, for the larva and the honey for, for bees especially. But something that's really interesting in insulation of hot tubs, ATV covers, that type of material is formaldehyde. And formaldehyde over time breaks down into formic acid. And it turns out that ant nests also produce formic acid. So what happens is bears mistake these hot tub covers or anything with formaldehyde in it for possibly an ant nest. So what happens is insulation on houses smell like ant nests sometimes to bears. So folks incur tremendous property damage sometimes where bears are trying to find what they think is an ant nest is actually just the insulation on their house or their trailer. And so we have some really significant hundreds, even thousands of dollars of damage uh, that insurance policies do not cover. <laughs> I was about to ask that if they cover that. So. No, and it's a, it's a real nightmare. It's, it's a tough one because people are scared. They're, they really assume that this bear is coming in the house and gonna get them. And there's all, you know, hundreds if not thousands of dollars of damage. And for the bear's perspective, you know, they, they've done all this work, they've torn into this house and there's no ants, there's no food reward. So they wasted their time and the calories and energy uh, expended into to finding an ant nest that was not there and so they don't come back and so what happens is for me as the, the guy that gets called about these types of, of things I don't really have any way to trap the bear the bear is so unlikely to return after wasting so much time and energy for nothing so it's really tough people are afraid there's lots of damage and I'm sort of my hands are, there's nothing really I can do <laughs> about it but I, I get these kinds of calls probably a half a dozen, eight or 10 times a year uh, throughout my area. So kind of a tough deal. Uh, as far as home ranges go, you know, male bears really uh, range pretty, pretty big areas, anywhere from 10 to 300 square miles. Uh, for females, anywhere from one to 50 square miles, so a much smaller area. But really, the home range of a bear, it really depends on the food resources. We talked about the variation um, throughout the year and from year to year about the natural foods. And when those foods are really abundant, bears don't have to travel as far. Uh, in those years like 2018, that was really a tough year for bears in terms of natural foods. Man, they were moving all over the place. And what that does, of course, is uh, not only is there not a lot of food for bears on the landscape, but they cross more highways, they go into unfamiliar areas. Uh, and that really exposes them to mortality risk even more above and beyond just the shortage of food. So it's, it's really tough. It's sort of everything gets amplified in those food failure years. But the, the home range again is really dependent on food resources and uh, the abundance. So hibernation, this is a question I get all the time. Uh, a lot of folks say, hey, I, I hear that bears don't really hibernate in, in Virginia. And technically that is true. Bears are not true hibernators. And an example of a true hibernator would be like a ground squirrel, an animal uh, like a rodent that spends a lot of their time 
collecting foods and uh, in their den underground or wherever they would store in another chamber all these foods, maybe seeds or grasses and things that they've stored away. And also a true hibernator, the ground squirrel drops their body temperature almost to just, just barely above freezing. Uh, they really drop that to reduce that metabolic rate and their need for food and oxygen and so on. Uh, the true hibernator also uh, reduces their respiration rate. They might just breathe once or twice a minute. Uh, their heart rate drops down to just a couple beats a minute. They're like a little ground squirrel, their heart rate might, they might have a 200 beat per minute heart rate. And that drops down to just, just a couple, just enough to pump some oxygen through the system. And with those few respirations, just enough oxygen to keep the animal alive and to oxygenate the uh, vital organs to keep the animal going. And then every now and again, that true hibernator, the ground squirrel will arouse, they will go and defecate, they will urinate, and then they will go to that chamber to, to eat. So a bear does none of these things. A bear goes into a deep sleep that we call torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R, -O and they do reduce their body rate or their body temperature, but only maybe 10, 15 degrees. And their heart, their heart rate and respiration rates will decrease, but not nearly as much as what a true hibernator does. But also black bears, they don't defecate, they don't urinate, and they don't eat for months. Uh, for us, of course, that would be super toxic for us to not eliminate those wastes, but bears are somehow able to overcome that and uh, deal with that. And they just live off of the fat that they've built up all year long, especially in the fall. So bears have a very unique um, sort of life strategy and how they deal with a short shortage of foods, uh, different from other animals, from other hibernators especially. So do hi bears hibernate? Technically no, but they do go into torpor and den up basically because there's no food available and they just live off of those fat stores. Bears typically enter dens anywhere between October and January. Uh, females that are pregnant and going to have cubs are the first ones to go in their den, followed by females with dependent young. And then younger bears and males typically go in to their dens later, uh, December, January. We've seen mostly in Virginia bears um, go into rock cavities or have ground dens, maybe under a, an uprooted tree and get under the, you know, underneath the uprooted part of the roots of the tree is a, is a good place. Um, but we've seen them in mine portals uh, here in Southwest Virginia in uh, tree dens as well. Uh, down in the bottom left, you can see this little bear was going to den under a deer carcass. <laughs> um, <laughs> but mostly uh, ground dens uh, here in, in Virginia. In some places, especially like in the, the Mississippi Delta, Louisiana, Mississippi, those areas, uh, more swampy areas, bears will den up in trees. They'll climb up into trees and stay up above water. But here in Virginia, mostly ground dens. Uh, as far as reproduction, uh, usually females will reproduce at three to four years of age. And then every two years, they will uh, have cubs. And they breed anywhere between June and August. Typically June and July are usually uh, when most breeding occurs. And females may mate with multiple males. They can have, even within one litter, they could have uh, cubs uh, fathered by, by multiple males. Uh, and they also, in bears, we see a phenomenon called delayed implantation. And basically what happens is when the female is bred in June or July and those eggs are fertilized, those eggs basically float around in her uterus until sometime in December. And what that does is basically if the female, as we talked about with, with variable foods, if the female is in really good body condition, those eggs will, more of those eggs will implant into the uterus and begin to, to grow and develop. If she's not in good shape, let's say we had a, a, a natural food failure, uh, few, if any of those eggs will implant and, uh, and grow. And basically it's sort of a, an insurance policy based on the, the food variability uh, and gives her the abilities to survive and only really allows um, the, the eggs to 
uh, to grow and develop that she can actually support because of her body condition. So again, that, that the natural foods and especially the fall foods and the importance really um, comes into play for these female bears that are pregnant. And uh, cubs are born typically in Jan mid to late January and they're just tiny little guys, little, you know, very little hair, uh, eyes are closed, the bottom left, you can see a one day old cub and they just start to grow. They sort of migrate to a, a mammary gland and latch on and just start to grow and eat. Uh, in Virginia, we see anywhere from two to three uh, cubs within a litter. We've seen as many as five. Uh, and again, it gets back to her body condition and how many eggs have been fertilized and what, her, what she can support in terms of her body condition. Uh, let's see. And they'll stay with their mother up until about 15 months, so as yearlings they'll stay with their mom. So Virginia, pretty much all of the state is considered bear country. Uh, I think Northampton is the only county that we've not had a verified black bear sighting. So pretty much everywhere in Virginia is bear country, especially here in the Southwest mountains. We have a lot of bears, particularly in Wise County. Um, Buchanan County is another one. We have a lot of bears, uh, but bears have really come back. You know, we had very few bears back when um, when Virginia was being settled in that and they were hunted out almost completely extirpated. We had a few little remnant populations uh, along the Blue Ridge and Allegheny Mountains and then some down in the Dismal Swamp. Uh, but over time, they really recovered. Bear populations have. Yeah, I was going to ask that because a lot of folks, you know, around here I've heard say that they're seeing more and more bears. Are we kind of seeing that tail of that increase still where there's more and more bears starting to take over the area or becoming more more prevalent? Yes, uh, for sure. You know, this this part of the state, it's been the last 15, 10 to 15 years that we've really seen that that big growth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, just natural population growth. And no, I have not been relocating and dropping bears in, in <laughs> body yards. Um, this is just all natural population growth. Uh, over time, you know, we had uh, protections of bears. We have really fantastic bear habitat here in Southwest Virginia. So all those things combined has really um, allowed the population to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're dealing with that. A uh, good segue into the next topic, which is human bear problems and learning to live with bears. You know, generations of folks here in Southwest Virginia, we just didn't have bears here. It wasn't an issue. And so folks are now having to learn now that bear populations have really recovered, uh, learn how, what that means, what it means to live with bears and to, re to reduce human bear problems. So I get lots and lots of calls about bears and garbage. That's typically what I hear the most, but bee yards, a lot more people are raising bees in the backyard, uh, bird feeders, pet food on the porch or deck. Those are the types of things that bears really find as an easy meal and get into and, and results in some sort of issue or problem. So we really um, try to work on the prevention side of it. We try to, are, are teaching folks to think about bears to prevent the conflict and problem from happening to begin with by reducing, um, securing or removing things that might attract a bear to your, your property, such as garbage, bird feeders, uh, beehives, pet food, all these types of things, and just try to prevent. You know, I, I can come and trap a bear and remove that bear or relocate the bear. But if you still have garbage and stuff on your property, you're gonna have another bear uh, because of that population growth and that we have. It's just a matter of time before another bear shows up. So that's why we, we emphasize uh, prevention when it comes to conflicts and problems. And so when you get back and you think about a bear, you know, they have to eat enough in six to eight months to sustain them for 12 months. And so that really, you get a sense of what they have to do and, and to put on weight and to survive a full 12 month cycle. You know, when you look at the list over here of things that we have that we throw away in our garbage that, you know, the amount of calories and what that means to a bear, uh, you know, bird seed, seven pounds of bird seed has over 12,000 calories. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see why that would be, you know, for a bear just trying to survive, why, they would be so attracted. Dog food, 42,000 calories in a 25 pound of Purina dog chow. <laughs> so you can understand, you know, from a uh, 
energetics and, and need of calories, why they would, they would come around, especially in the years of, of food failures, uh, why stuff that we have around our homes would be so attractive to a bear in terms of their survival. So we have lots of stuff going on here in Southwest Virginia. There's Clark's Welding down in Appalachia, a local welding shop. They've done a fantastic job. They've been making these bear-proof lids with, uh, with lids that bears cannot get into. And the local garbage haulers really like them. And it's just, it worked out really great. Uh, we, my agency has invested a lot of money into this. And so have other entities, uh, the city of Norton, uh, Wise County, a lot of the schools are starting to <clears throat> starting to look into these types of dumpsters to keep bears and other wildlife for that matter. We've got raccoons, all sorts of things that could get into dumpsters. And these things work great. We've got a local option, which is wonderful. Uh, other bear resistant containers, uh, this toter bear type cart, I actually have one of these. I got it at Lowe's here in Wise County. And I've got one of these and my wife and I, we watched a bear try to get into our garbage here, right, right in the town of Wise. Uh, a couple nights in a row and he never got in and as a result he's never been back so it, it works great. Uh, Lowe's has these right now actually in stock in, in Wise County. Uh, the top left is uh, for those of you that that backpack or like to maybe hike a couple overnight uh, a couple overnights maybe on the Appalachian Trail or something like that you could consider one of these it's called the bear keg. Uh, it's really lightweight and holds a surprisingly high amount of food Great thing to take in the back country if you're if you're going to camp in bear country, and you can see down on the lower left that's a, a really nice heavy duty metal enclosure for garbage. That's up at Norton Reservoir here in Wise County. Uh, the city of Norton has purchased a number of those around Fly Rock Recreation Area, both their campgrounds and and the, the reservoir and stuff. Uh, we've got some other uh, entities, a lot of public parks and places around in the in the region that more and more are starting to purchase these and put them in place to keep bears out of garbage. And it's really doing great. It keeps the parks looking clean and they're, they're just really nice and uh, makes for a much better user experience and keeps bears out of trouble. Electric fence, that's a tool I use all the time. Bears hate electricity. Uh, and this is up at Grundy High School. Uh, and I just whipped this out really quick and, and dirty, you know, the bears were coming into the cafeteria dumpsters behind the school and having nothing gets my phone ringing quicker than bears on a school campus. So uh, I put this electric fence up. They have since put in their permanent electric fence and some other bear proof lids on the, the school campus there. They have no more bear problems solved, dealt with. So it's been great. But electric fencing you can find at any hardware store, any home improvement store, farm and ranch store, in just about every town in Southwest Virginia. So it's very available, it's very inexpensive, uh, and you can electrify anything I've found. The Critter Getter, uh, that's sort of a noise maker. It's, it's a remote sensing uh, device that emits a really obnoxious sound and flashing lights uh, when it detects movement. So I use those a lot on porches if a bear's coming onto a porch. Uh, maybe uh, into a fruit tree or a chicken coop, and it works really well. Uh, so that's pretty much it. You know, we again, we just really focus on thinking about what bears eat, why they need that, and then how to secure attractants at your home. And, and that's what we really preach is the prevention aspect of that. But I really, hopefully everybody learned something a little new about bears that they didn't already know. And hopefully, you know, it seems like when I talk about bears and, and what their life strategy is and why they get into our foods the way they do, uh, people go, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And it, they suddenly realize, well, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to scrape by and provide for my family just the same. And they start to realize, you know, they're not as scary. They, it, it sort of explains what it is the bear is doing and why they're coming around houses. And it sort of allays people's fear a lot, I think, uh, by just talking about about that sort of stuff. So, so hopefully with that, um, hopefully, you know, as we're staying home and we're, we're um, the stay at home order or self quarantining or whatever, you can look, you can take the time to look around in your yard and think about, you know, things that might attract a bear and garbage or whatever to secure or remove to try to uh, prevent uh, problems with bears at home. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and I had questions, but you honestly addressed every single one of them. <laughs> so that's perfect. <laughs> okay. I'll just second, you know, when we uh, moved into our house near Wise, we got all excited because we, we live right against the woods and we were taking care of our garbage, but we had bird feeders out and we learned pretty quickly, can't have any bird feeders <laughs> in our yard because the bears were coming out and, and getting into those. So I think you're right. It's all about, you know, looking at what you've got, what could possibly be, you know, an attractant or that kind of thing. So and do y'all have a website? I was trying to find it earlier. Is there like a, a bear website that DGIF has that folks could learn more about? Yes, I think if you if you go to our main uh, website page, uh, dgif.virginia.gov, there's probably a link on the front page about bears, especially this time of year, um, that should take folks to additional information about bears and how to prevent conflicts and so on. So there should be a link right on our home page. Awesome. Yeah, I just pulled it up and there is. So if folks go to that Excellent. and they want to learn more. I know I've seen that website before. It's a really, really good website that, that has some good information as well. You know, after you watch this video, if you want to check it out. Well, thanks so much again, Seth. And uh, thanks for everybody for watching. And, and uh, hopefully people don't have bear problems this year. But if they do, I imagine Seth will be busy <laughs> going into the, the coming season. So thanks again for uh, coming on and talking with us. You bet. Thanks for having me.